little boy came up to his mother one evening and handed her a piece of paper that he had worked on, he had written out, and it read, cutting the grass, $5. Cleaning up my room, $3. Babysitting my younger brother, $4. Taking out the garbage, $2. And he had listed out a number of things and he had totaled it at the bottom, totaling $15. He gave it to her. He watched her eyes as she read it. There was a little nervousness in his heart, and she flipped it over. And she wrote herself, carrying you in my belly for nine months, no charge. For all the nights that I stayed up with you while you were sick and doctored you, no charge. For all the trying times and the tears. And when I was on my face praying and begging God on your behalf, no charge. For all the toys and food and clothes and even wiping your snotty nose, no charge. Total, no charge. Little boy saw it thought for a moment, flipped on the other side, his side, and wrote in big letters, paid in full. (laughs) Uh, No doubt we want to pause and just say, happy Mother's Day to you. Uh, If my mom is watching online, happy Mother's Day to you. I love you and many mothers here, okay? Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter four as we continue our walk through our sermon series that's titled Church Matters. As we've been walking through the book of Ephesians, Paul has been pressing us on the importance of church. Let me just call quick attention to in two weeks, on May 23rd, there's gonna be a special service, the announcement I gave earlier, an unveiling of something that's really important to the life of our church. And so circle that date, Hopefully you can be here. And then that evening, we're going to have a night of vision and prayer. Uh, Me casting vision for where God's taking us. Praise the Lord that we're able to have now baby dedication and baptisms. God is doing amazing things. And so we want to have a special night of, of worship and prayer. We'll have some town hall discussion. And so you really need to be here if you can. Uh, Sunday night, May 23rd at 5 p.m. Okay. Ephesians Chapter four, the first six verses. And listen as I read. Paul writes, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, There is one body and one spirit, just as you also were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with a declaration from your word that you are God that you are on your throne, that you are the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, that everything is from you and through you and to you. Glory to your name this day. Father, as we open your word, we pray and we ask that your spirit would press into us as you continue to describe what you require of your local church, would you teach us? Would you convict us? Because when you convict us, not only do you convict, you empower and you heal at the same time. We need you this morning. Jesus Christ to walk worthy of your church and we pray all of that in his name. Amen. Church, I wanna 
begin and share a quick story out of this book, uh, The Insanity of God by Nick Ripkin, a story about uh, trials that the persecuted church has endured. Nick went to Russia to hear stories of the persecuted church underneath communist uh, USSR. And I want to read for you this story. A pastor was arrested, put in prison, and then his wife and children moved out of their home, out of their hometown, and were exiled to live in Siberia. One wintry night in their remote, dilapidated uh, wooden cabin, which now served as their home, the three children divided their family's last crust of bread and drank their last cup of tea in the house before climbing into bed, still very hungry. Kneeling to say their prayers, they asked, where are we gonna get some food, mama? We're hungry. Do you think Papa even knows where we live now? Their mother assured them that their heavenly father knew where they were and that for now, he is the one who had to provide for them. So they prayed and they asked for God's provision. 30 kilometers away, in the middle of the night, God woke up the deacon of a church and instructed him, get up, get out of bed, harness your horse, hitch the horse to the sled, load up the extra vegetables that the church has harvested, the meat and the other food that the congregation has collected, and take it to the pastor's family who's living outside the village. They are hungry. The deacon said, but Lord, I can't do that. It's below freezing outside. My horse might freeze. I might freeze. The Holy Spirit told him, you must go. The pastor's family is in trouble. The man argued, Lord, you've got to know that there are wolves everywhere. They can eat my horse. And if they do, they'll eat me. I may never make it back. But the deacon said that the Holy Spirit told him, you don't have to come back, but you do have to go. Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This passage that we have before us in Ephesians chapter four is one of those magnificent one another passages. A description of the love and the relationship that Christians are supposed to have with their brothers and sisters, no matter age or ethnicity or affluence or education. I pray that at some point in your life, you've had a similar experience that I did whenever I went to India for three months during college. And even though I was on the other side of the world, even though there was a language barrier, there were cultural barriers, we sat gathered together in a dirt hut about 15 other Indians who were Christians. And there was a bond. There was a fellowship as they sang in their own tongue and dialect. And I didn't know the words. My heart leapt with joy for my brothers and sisters to hear them praise. Why? Because in Jesus Christ, we were one. We were united. I pray that you've had an experience like that. A love for one another. It would be helpful at this point for me to paint the picture, to build the blocks of what Paul has walked through in the book of Ephesians. My mind works that way. I guess it's because I'm an engineer, but I want you to understand the context of everything that we're standing upon. In chapter one, at the beginning of the spring, we walk through every spiritual blessing that you and I have in Christ Jesus Okay, every spiritual blessing that you've been chosen, adopted, redeemed, okay, that, he, that you have <coughs> um, obtained an inheritance, that you've been sealed in the Holy Spirit, and I missed one in there and I can't remember, that you've been, oh, I gotta move on, sorry. After that, at the end of chapter one, Paul begins to pray that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened so that we would know every spiritual blessing is ours, so that you would grasp that. And that's how he ends chapter one, a prayer that that would be driven into our hearts. Chapter two, Paul preaches the gospel, that you were dead 
in your sin. But now Jesus has made you alive from the dead. And that the gospel, as it works itself out in our lives, that no longer are Jew and Gentile, do they have a dividing wall in between? No longer is they're hostile and separated, but rather that as a Christian, we've been made into one new man. They call it the third race. And that in Jesus Christ, we are united. And then he uses this description that we are now a living temple, alive, that we, we, we as the church, as we gather, we are the living temple because we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Then in chapter three, then in chapter three, Paul begins to say this picture of the living temple is the manifold wisdom of God. That the church right here is on display for all of the heavenlies, the manifold wisdom of God. And Paul says, don't worry about any trial and tribulation. I am happy that my life is poured out as an offering for the church. And then he pauses and prays again. And this is where we were last week. He prays that you and I would go deeper and deeper, that we would understand the width, the length, the height, the breadth of the love that is in Christ Jesus. Because when we understand that, we will actually be able to live this out. So the first three chapters of Ephesians have been this exalted theological picture of what we are called to be as Christians. You remember, I, I brought out and I played with the bricks about this beautiful picture of the diversity of the living temple of God. Well, now chapter four, verse one, he says, therefore, okay? And he is, it's everything that we've just described and he's gonna move from the lofty theological picture down to our feet, to practical application. And that's what's gonna happen through the rest of the book of Ephesians, four, five, and six. This first three verses is a header for the rest of the book of walking this out in practical application. So Paul writes, therefore, I implore you to walk worthy. Now that your head and your heart are full with this magnificent picture of who we're called to be, now it has to move to your feet. Those feet have to get moving. You see, obedience is always the response to grace. If it is this good that you have every spiritual blessing, that the church is the living temple of God, then we have a lot to walk out, don't we? But Paul actually says it even stronger than that. He says, walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Christian, this is your calling. I know we often think that pastors get callings and they no longer work secular jobs. You've been called to go work in the church and that's true, but catch this. This passage here says every single one of us has been called by God to accomplish what's unfolding here today. The calling to live up to who we are as a church. Now that's pretty special. That gets your attention, right? But now listen. How does he describe what it looks like to walk worthy of this calling. Pause and think for a second in your mind. If I said to you, hey, what does it look like for you to walk worthy? I commonly think our minds would immediately run to a list of all the don'ts, right? Oh, oh, to walk worthy would mean I, I'm not struggling with lust and I don't get easily angered at my children. All the don'ts. Oh, then I would be walking worthy. 
And if your mind did go to the do's, the, the things that you know you're supposed to do, I, I think it would readily just be, oh, oh I, I read my Bible and, and I have a good quiet time and prayer time in the morning. The disciplines. But what I want you to notice about the, both of those, either positive or negative, they're individualistic. But listen to where Paul goes, the very first thing whenever he says, you are called to walk worthy with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. He goes immediately to the love and unity of the one another's of what it means to be a part of a local church. You're gonna walk worthy. This is great. Everything that Jesus has given you, love one another in the church. Isn't that incredible? How we treat each other in the local church. What should the atmosphere be? What should the flavor in the air be, the culture, when God's sons and daughters gather together? What should that be? Humility, gentleness, patience, a unity, a love for one another. (laughs) I want to read for you a story out of one of our growth groups In September 2015, Brenda and I were involved in a serious automobile accident near our home. By the time we were airlifted to University Hospital, four Agape Growth Group uh, couples were already at the hospital to pray for us and to lend assistance in every way that they could. Brenda was in the hospital for nearly a week. During that time, the Agape women organized a 24-7 schedule that no matter what time of day or night, an Agape woman was with Brenda to assist her, reassure her, and advocate for her when necessary. After we were discharged from the hospital, meals were organized and delivered to our home. If we had a doctor's appointment, someone from the Agape uh, class was there to lend a ride and to run an errand, even to attend to our yard while we were recuperating. What did we learn during this experience? Well, don't be involved in a serious automobile accident. Seriously. It was the first time as a couple that we were incapable of caring for ourselves and for each other. And in Christ's love, the Agape Growth Group gave love at a time when we really needed it. There's a reason that Paul starts (laughs) with the quality of humility first in this list. You see, because for those who were once dead in their sin, and are now alive, the gospel leaves no option but to be humble. Every one of us in this room should spend eternity in hell but for Jesus, but for our gentle and lowly king who came to us mounted and humble on a donkey who at his birth was laid in an animal's feeding trough and at his death had to borrow another man's tomb. That king spoke to our hearts these very words, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. And you awoke from spiritual death and realized that the King of kings and Lord of lords had drunk the full wrath of God's wrath against your sin, that he had taken it upon himself so that you could be forgiven. How can a Christian be anything but humble? Have this attitude in yourselves, 
which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, truth be told, to be proud as a Christian is to be blind. So let us ask ourselves this really important question this morning. As a church, as a local church, First Baptist Bernie, what is the culture, what is the flavor in the air when we gather together as sons and daughters of the king? Would these words be read about us? Gentle, patient, showing tolerance for one another. Do you know that humility was not considered a virtue, but rather a vice in the ancient Greek culture? I mean, no way were you supposed to be considered humble. Only slaves were supposed to be humble. But the Christian begins by checking his ego with God, realizes it is all about him. Were it not for Jesus, were it not for our gentle and humble king, where would I be? And that allows us to walk like him and talk like him. Gentle, patient, showing tolerance for one another in love. Now, I know I need to pause for a second because when I use that word tolerance, some of you kind of twitched like this because our culture has absolutely hijacked that term and turned it into a weapon that says, listen, you must be tolerant, okay? If you love me, you must agree with everything that I do and feel which, by the way, is complete nonsense, okay? 1 Corinthians 13, 6, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. If I love you, it doesn't mean I have to agree with everything you do. As a culture, we've become overly sensitive and timid in the name of tolerance. And again, a weapon that we use to put others on the defense. But listen to this passage. It has nothing to do with weaponizing other people. It says the exact opposite. Listen as they're put together the way that the local church is supposed to be when we gather gentle, patient, showing tolerance for one another in love. Not trigger happy, not harsh or reactionary or easily exasperated. Being understanding with one another, accessible, approachable, a safe place where we can confess our sins and repent from them, allowing freedom that if I've figured something out, I will give you the time to learn it too. Can I just tell you how patient my Lord and Savior is with me? Is he not patient with you? I remember a couple years ago, I was, I was sitting, uh, having a quiet time, and I began to think and be convicted that there are a number of times where I come across like I use people. I'm very driven and, and I, I try to accomplish a lot. I don't want to waste time. And so there will be times where I pick up the phone and I ask someone for a favor and then realize I only call them whenever I want something. So I began to be convicted about that. And suddenly the Spirit of God just said, that's how you are with me. Now, no doubt I was taken back and humbled, repentant in that moment. But there was a startling truth that as I sat there and pressed in began to wash over me. And it was this truth. Jason, you've always been this way. You've walked with the Lord for 20 plus years. And God in his kindness waited for this day at this moment to press you with that character flaw of yours. Isn't God patient? 
right? When you come to faith, he doesn't go, hey, let's do business, son. And overwhelm you. But in his kindness, in the loving, tender care of a father who disciplines and shapes a son or a daughter, he does them one at a time. How incredible. Showing tolerance for one another in love. One commentator wrote, a better translation is putting up with each other in love. Putting up with each other in love. I love that because that's what family does. Right? That's what family does. We put up with one another in love. So been on a few car trips with the family and when all five of us get packed in and we're driving down the road, it's usually about 30 minutes into the trip that there begins to be some grumblings that come from the back. And it usually sounds like this. Hey dad, you're not cool anymore. We don't like your music. It ain't cool dad, come on. How long are we going to have to listen to your music? So what we do is we go on a rotation on the car trip, and my kids love hip-hop and rap, okay? So for the 30 minutes to an hour that we're driving down the road and we're listening to hip-hop and rap, what could be going through my mind is this is the worst. I don't want to listen to this. They are putting me in a bad mood. Or I could think, God, this is what I've always longed for, a family that the five of us get to go on this trip together. And part of the cost of being together is I listen to music that I don't like. Praise you, God. Put up with one another in love. That's what families do. And what I love about this passage is that's real life. This passage busts that bubble and says, by the way, being a part of a church is real life. It's, it's, it's not like, it, it, by the way, this is the way that it is with families, right? What you put on your Facebook profile is so beautiful, it's so clean, it's so pristine. But if you came and spent the weekend at my house, you know what you would say? Oh, they're normal, just like the rest of us, right? That's what happens when you bust that bubble. It's real life. So let me say this, I'm gonna get real with you. Many of you have been hurt by unhealthy churches that have wounded you and not been what scripture calls them to be. I'm sorry. I'm genuinely sorry. As a pastor, from the depths of my soul, I'm sorry. But we have a trend in our culture. I don't know if it's because of that, or other things where we keep church an arm's length away. By the way, everything looks great from an arm's length away. You're like, man, that pastor's good, that music's good, I like this, I like that. Everything from an arm's length away, when you're a consumer, it looks great. But when you enter in, you've done this before in churches, you're like, hey, uh, there's some crazy folk in this church. It gets messy. It gets messy. Anytime you enter in and you start rolling up your sleeves, it gets messy. But that's what he says. Put up with one another in love. That's when it gets real, guys. So I need to make two quick points of application and then we're done. Number one, we can't love out there until we love in here. I didn't have time to look this up. Maybe one of you can do it for me this week. Looking at the number of times in the New Testament that Jesus or the rest of the New Testament refers to 
love for one another within the church versus the command to love our enemies, love those outside the church. If you balance those two, you know which one overwhelmingly the New Testament highlights? Within the church. Overwhelmingly. It doesn't mean we're not supposed to love our enemies. Overwhelmingly, the New Testament repeats over and over. Love for one another. We'll love for one another. We'll love for one another. Why? Because if we can't do it in here, we won't do it out there. This is profound because our culture is desperate for unity and they have no way to get it. They have no clue how to get it. Now, I want, I want you to ask you, how are we doing culturally as a witness of our churches to the lost world? Do they think we're unified? No. If we don't roll up our sleeves and learn to love each other in here, it's all superficial out there. You know that? Jesus in John 17, he prays a prayer that's known as the high priestly prayer. He prays out loud to his disciples before, this is the last thing that occurs in John before we move towards uh, the Passover, the Lord's Supper and all that stuff. And he prays out loud. The entire chapter is his out loud prayer. And he prays for the unity that exists within the Trinity from the Father to the Son to be given to the church. He prays it over and over. I pray that they're unified. And then he makes this correlation, okay? He makes this correlation, it's off the charts. In verses 21 and 23, he says, when the church is unified, the world will know that the Father has sent the Son. That's what he says. The world will know that Jesus is the Messiah. His promise, his prayer, not, not, that's just what he says. How incredible is that? That when the unity, when the one another's exist here, it is such a light that the outside world cannot deny. I want what they have. I want to read for you a letter out of church history. Uh, from Aristides, who is a Greek philosopher who converted to Christianity, and he wrote to Caesar a defense of Christians. This is in the second century. And he wrote because Christians had a love for one another that was so contrary, so opposite from the culture that he was giving this defense I'll just read portions of it out of the middle. He says, if one of the Christians have a bondman or a bondwoman, that's a servant or a slave, or children, through love towards them, they persuade them to become Christian. And when they have done so, they call them brethren without distinction. They do not worship false gods or strange gods, they're very modest and they love one another. They're widows, they do not turn away their esteem and they deliver the orphan from him who treats him harshly. And he who has gives to him who has not without boasting. And when they see a stranger, they take him in into their homes and rejoice over him as a very brother. For they do not call them brethren after the flesh, but rather brethren after the spirit and in God. And whenever one of the poor passes from this world, each one of them, according to his ability, gives heed to him and carefully sees to his burial. And if they hear that one of their number is imprisoned or afflicted on account of the name of their Messiah... All of them anxiously minister to his needs, and if possible, they redeem him to set him free. That means they pay. And if there is anyone among them that is poor and needy, and if they have no spare food, they fast two or three days in order to supply to the needy their lack of food. Secondly, 
this picture of the church that's been developed all through the book of Ephesians, this family picture is contrary to an independent, consumer-driven church. The complete opposite from where our culture is and where it's moving. The consumer-driven church keeps everything from an arm's length away and says, what's good for me? There is a call here to enter in. Enter into where it's messy. Enter into where you can become known and know others. I'm going to share with you a recent Gallup poll. Just came out last week that for the first time in American history that this poll has been done, the percentage of Americans that have a church home for the first time fell below 50%. Less than half of Americans now claim that they have a church home. When the poll began in the 1930s, it was at 73%. And held at 70% all the way through the 90s. Starting in about the 2000s, it began to dip and for the first time has now dropped below 50%. Now you may say to yourself, oh, well, well that just means that few and few people are calling themselves Christians. Even amongst those who call themselves religious, only 60% say that they have a church home. Six out of 10. Why? Well, there are lots of reasons. But more than anything, it's because we keep everything at an arm's length away. I've been wrestling all week with whether to say what I'm about to say. I need your permission to step on your toes. Okay? You've given me permission, now I can say whatever I want. (laughs) There was an odd thing that I noticed. I've been here a year when I came to Bernie here at First Baptist. A really odd thing that occurs in uh, in this town, in the church culture. The only way I can describe it is I'll call it a la carte church. And what I mean by that is families routinely choose, I like what they're doing on Wednesday night. I like what they're doing for home groups. And I like the, the music on Sunday morning. I will just go around and pick a la carte church. It's odd. And that's fine If you're a consumer and you ask yourself, what's on the menu this week? But that's not a picture of what the Bible teaches about church. And here, let me give you a warning. Here's why it matters. Because you can bounce between different circles of life and you can never be known. You can keep everything an arm's length away. You can resist any sort of authority from a local church and you can hide, hide, hide. But what happens when your world falls apart? Who's there to catch you? Who's there to call you out on your sin? The second anything becomes messy or uncomfortable, you just hop over here and hop over there. How are we ever going to put up with one another in love and show the unity of rolling up our sleeves and going, you know what? I don't like you, but I love you. Unless we're all in. I want to close with a final story, another one from our growth groups, because even though I press you guys hard, we do a lot of incredible things here. Several years ago, I invited my best friend Kathy to join our growth group as we had begun to study a new book. Now, I fully expected her to say no, but I was pleasantly surprised to hear her say, yeah, I'll come. She ended up faithfully attending uh, the book study and quickly fell in love with the people in our group and the study of God's word. 
She looked forward to it each week and was amazed at the love and care shown by the members of our group, particularly the way that we prayed for each other and always went out of our way to make sure that each person's needs were met. In June of 2018, Kathy was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of cancer. She shared this with our class and immediately we gathered around her to pray. Members of our class walked with her every step of the journey. They prayed for her, shared with her, sent her encouraging cards and texts. Kathy went home to be with the Lord on November 23rd, 2018. Little did she know that when she became a part of our class, that it would be so vital to her. And we did not realize the profound impact that Kathy would have on each of us. We were allowed to witness her great faith in God. And we were humbled at how deeply she trusted him in the valley of the shadow of death. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray right now all across this room, again, that your spirit would convict. Father, if they hear my words, it only comes as shame and condemnation. But Father, when you convict, you heal and you encourage and you give us the strength to walk out in a new direction. Father, I pray over the congregation that we would be a humble people. Humble like you, King Jesus. And that you would teach us to be patient and gentle and tolerate one another. That you would give us the strength to roll up our sleeves to be known and to know others. There's so much that you are calling us to do that when we pray, that when we pray collectively as a church, your kingdom will come and your will be done. But Father, you care how much we know each other. Help us to be the church. Help us to walk worthy. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.